This year is the 20th anniversary of Apple's iTunes software and the first iPod, and this month marks two decades since Napster offered to pay a billion dollars to settle its landmark lawsuit with the recording industry in the US. So in a world where streaming music accounts for 85% of recorded music sales, it's worth looking back to see just how we got here. In 1999, global annual sales of recorded music exceeded $35 billion, mostly from CDs. This was all still pre-iPod, but MP3 players did exist. This combination of affordable computers, widespread internet access, and portable music players created the opportunity for software called Napster to spread like wildfire. The free file sharing tool let people exchange songs that they'd copied from their own CDs with each other. Quickly though, people realized they didn't need to buy the CDs as long as one person on the Napster network had copied it once, after which it could be redistributed infinitely. Tens of millions of people flocked to the service and a resultant nosedive of music industry revenue led to record labels and bands even suing their fans as part of a collective existential panic. Lost amid the court hearings, though, was the fact that people weren't downloading music illegally because it was illegal. They were doing it because they could get more of something they wanted quickly and for a lot less money than they could before. We've seen over the past 20 years, with everything from music to in-app software subscriptions, even retail stock trading, that the simpler and more convenient something is, the easier it is to get people who use it to start paying for it. This was how Apple saw music amid the Napster fallout. In 2001, it launched iTunes and the iPod, whose functional simplicity belied the fact that neither were fundamentally unique consumer concepts. The iPod sold in the millions, and within a couple of years, accounted for more than half of all hard drive-based portable music players sold in the US. Now, this emboldened Apple to persuade a piracy-battered music industry to accept its radical lifeline let it sell legal music downloads through iTunes exclusively for people who bought Apple products. The record labels agreed, and in 2003, the iTunes Music Store launched, with 200,000 songs costing just 99 cents each. Apple sold a million song downloads in the first week, and by 2005, it had sold 500 million more. A year later, iTunes was responsible for about 70% of all downloaded music purchases, and thanks to the iPod's ongoing appeal, it had no real competitor of the same scale. That was until Jeff Bezos came along. Amazon.com sold a lot of CDs in 2006, and it knew downloading threatened that, but it also saw that people increasingly wanted to play music they'd bought on any device they wanted, not just Apple products. In 2007, Amazon began a music download service of its own with no digital rights management, meaning downloads would play on any device, Apple or otherwise. Microsoft was in the game too with the Zune. You remember that, it was the brown one. It had a feature called squirting for some reason. Before long, everyone was selling DRM-free songs, including Apple. By 2009, two other increasingly important consumer habits were forming. Companies like Last.fm, Pandora, and Slacker showed that people really enjoyed radio-like services that streamed music to them rather than asking them to pay for and download each song up front. On top of that, smartphones were becoming increasingly popular too, with about 153 million of them sold in 2008, and projections at the time that that number would almost double a year later. A Swedish company was paying attention and put these trends together and correctly predicted the future. People would always want more music, and they want it first and foremost on their smartphones, but also they'd be prepared to pay for it as long as the service was easy to use and convenient. Spotify was an instant hit. More than a million people downloaded the application in five months after its debut in Europe, offering six million tracks and unlimited streaming for the equivalent cost of about two albums from iTunes or Amazon. By 2012, it had about 3 million paying customers, and by 2015, about 12 million more, plus tens of millions who were listening on an ad-supported free version. But Apple was still only selling albums and songs one by one, and after years of that model working, global sales of downloaded music had started to show signs of decline. 
The Apple Music streaming service was announced in June of 2015, with 30 million songs available for unlimited listening for about $10 a month, and it competes fiercely with Spotify today. Broad estimates suggest the services have in excess of 200 million paying customers between them, and in part because of this, the music industry has finally returned to growth after years of decline since the Napster era. In 2020, Apple deprecated the iTunes software on the Mac. Apple Music is now the default way of paying for and listening to music on most devices, yet at the same time, sales of vinyl records have been growing steadily since 2005. In 2015, they actually outsold download of music in the UK at one point. And in the US, in the first half of last year, people spent nearly twice as much money on vinyl as they did on CDs. You can tell me whether you prefer vinyl or downloads or something else in the comments. And let me know what your favorite MP3 player of all time was. For me, it's always gonna be Apple's 30 gigabyte iPod Classic. For Quick Take in London, I'm Nate Langson, and I've been Technically Speaking.